I want to bring up, as I just said, second group, and we're going to be talking to Gary Hoover, and he's going to be talking about the economics of inequality with our uh, second group of provocateurs, Simon, Zoe, and Joe. So, Hoove, you have seven minutes on the clock, and your time starts now. Okay, economic inequality has been on the rise across the globe. Uh, however, this isn't a new phenomenon. We've actually seen the rate of inequality accelerate over the last several decades. Uh, we've seen an increase in both in-country and between-country inequality. By some estimate, uh, the richest 1% of the world's population has seen their share of global wealth increase from 28% to 33%. Uh, in addition, the lowest 75% of the world's population has seen their share of global wealth remain constant at about 10%. Uh, also, we've seen that countries rich in natural resources have seen their poverty rates uh, go up and remain stubbornly high, while other countries have been able to exploit those natural um, resources and actually widen the wealth gap. Now, some would argue that this inequality is actually a good thing. It shows that innovators and first movers and entrepreneurs are taking risk and engaging in activities to bring new products and services to the market. And since they took all the risk, they should be the ones who should get the lion's share of the benefits. But they go one step further. They say that eventually uh, these new technologies will sift through the entire society and everyone will have access to these new products and services. And then they can use those same products and services to decrease the wealth gap. Um, what these people miss, though, is what happens when inequality violates the social contract. By social contract, I mean when society tells an individual that, hey, if you engage in certain human capital enhancing activities, such as education, that no matter where your starting point is, that you too can move up the economic ladder. So it's a violation of the social contract when that doesn't take place. For instance, when a young Egyptian goes on to get a bachelor's degree, or maybe even a master's degree, but can't find employment other than driving a taxi, well, that's a violation of that social contract. Uh, but let's bring it closer to home. Here, we have free and compulsory uh, education. And we say that anyone who doesn't take advantage of these educational opportunities, well, this must be someone who's satisfied with their place on the economic ladder. But what happens when an individual takes advantage of all of the educational opportunities available to him or her, but still finds themselves woefully underprepared when you compare them to their peers? You see, it's a violation of the social contract when the quality of the education that one receives is tied to their zip code. Uh, furthermore, we say that we encourage everyone to engage in entrepreneurial activities, to be innovators. But we also know that to be an innovator, to be an entrepreneur, one needs access to financial markets. But we know that access to credit markets isn't equal so that even the person with the most ardent and sincere entrepreneurial drive isn't able to succeed because they don't have access. What we end up creating is some type of caste system or um, even a, a series of second class citizens. Finally, we know that no economy works well without a well-functioning court system. After all, no two individuals are going to enter into an economic contract with each other if they know that there's no court available to adjudicate any differences that might arise later. But what does it say when one part of your society is only familiar with the criminal court system and another part of your society is only familiar with the civil court system? You see, 
all of these inequities are violations of the social contract. And let's be clear, these violations aren't happening in a vacuum. People know where they are on the economic ladder. In fact, we have a term for that. We call this social comparison, where people know where they are. In fact, we go even further and we say that this can be described as envy. And this envy can be either benign or, or malicious. So when envy is, is benign, individuals lower down on the income distribution, see their peers higher on the income distribution, and they say that they want to emulate them, that they want to engage in the same activities as them so that they can occupy that same spot. However, when it becomes malicious because of violations of the social contract that I just mentioned before, individuals lower down on the income distribution, see their peers higher up on the income distribution, and say the gap is too far. In fact, the gap is artificial. And they will go so far as to say that if there is a system that allows such an ex uh, a gap to exist, that I want to destroy that system. Now that's not healthy. That's not good for any economy. In addition, we say that individuals see that gap between them and people above, and malicious envy can be when they see that gap, and they say, yes, I'll close that gap between me and the person above me, but I'm not going to do it by engaging in human capital enhancing activities, which is going to raise my income. The way I'm going to do it is I'm going to reach up and I'm going to destroy the wealth of those people ahead of me. And therefore, that's how I'm going to close that gap. So look, here we are. We're standing on the knife's edge and we got a chance to make a decision about how we're going to go forward. We can have sustainable, long run and reliable economic growth when we appeal to the social contract or we can continue with this inequity that we have now, which is going to see a destruction of the entire economic system. I'm done and I still got a second left. Well done. Absolutely fantastic. Leave it to an economist to end on time. Let's get seven minutes for our conversation with our provocateurs. Whoever's interested, whoever wants to go first, go first. Just go. Raise a hand. Say something. Do something. Simon, I saw you first. Well, you go first. Yeah. Well, thanks, Hugh, for that uh, terrific uh, talk. So one of my concerns, one of the concerns of this uh, whole forum is global sustainability. And I think it's perfectly clear that uh, um, the, the increasing degrees of inequity, both within our countries and among countries, are a threat to that. On the other hand, um, we in the West have been living in privileged societies for a long time. And um, developing countries um, want the right to engage in things which will close the equity gap, but it might be threatening to some sort of environmental sustainability. Do you see a conflict there and how do we resolve that? Great question. Well, it, it, there is a conflict. However, um, everyone, every sovereign nation has an economic model which can provide for economic growth that isn't destructive. Once again, it goes back to the principle I was talking about of the social contract when we allow everyone to be innovative and come up with new ideas, how do we know that there isn't a new technology that would allow us to close the wealth gap, but also find sustainability with the climate? We don't know that when we block out people from even entering the discussion. Yeah, fantastic. Joe, you had a question, go. I was gonna ask you to put, um... Uh, your uh, your your thoughts on this into a historical context, because it seems like as you were talking, I was I was it, it got me to thinking of different the cycles that I feel like we have been through uh, historically in this same the same kind of cycle of of of, of what you've described, um, and oftentimes people feel like we live in a and you spoke of this a vacuum and 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 the past doesn't have an effect on on how we're living now. So I just I was just wondering if you could put put uh, put your thoughts into kind of a historical context as well. Here's the problem. When there were fewer people on the earth, right? 
our arrogance, if you want to call that, or these inequities weren't as big and as magnified as they are today. As the world increases to, uh, in, continues to increase in population, our margins for error are decreasing. And as new technologies have come into place and people are able to see these inequalities that exist between nations and between people, they're going to strike out. If we had this same conversation 200 years ago where news spread by you know, newspaper or word of mouth, that's not the same as today. Over time, technology has allowed me to know exactly what you're doing in real time. So I can see the inequity as it's happening and I will strike out. Fantastic. Zoe. Yeah. I'll jump in. Um, I'll say something that really stuck out to me is when you were talking about how some people see inequality as profitable, because in many ways it is. Uh, and, you know, to piggyback on what Joe was saying, I was thinking back to history and especially, um, you know, the invent of the you know construction of slavery and how we profited off of having second class citizens and institutionalizing that into society. Um, and so given that, you know, obviously economics in many ways is a study of incentives, how do we incentivize people um, to strive for equality and to strive for equity? in the systems that they're creating? Because right now, I think we can all agree that many of us are just driven by how can we continue to make the most profit possible? Um, and that minimizes the opportunities of others. Zoe took my it's question. A, it's a very interesting point, but here's what most people miss on that. Some types of inequality aren't actually that bad. As I said before, you know, we want to encourage people to step out front and to be first movers and innovators. But we want to make sure that those opportunities exist for everyone. Because when we're talking about this thing and what you brought up is this, every time I put myself ahead by holding you back, I make it so that you can't be a consumer of mine. So I want to make a product or come up with a new innovative technology, but what good is it if I can't distribute it, sell it, or gain from it. I can't sell you something if you don't have any money. So if it were up to me, my thing would be, I want to make a product that enhances your life so that you then can enhance mine. How do we rewrite and or recreate the social contract? How do we reimagine the social contract that has the inequality built out of it and equality built into it? It goes back to what I was saying before. We get rid of the inequality and we add in equality when we realize, as I as an individual realize, that you being better off actually makes it easier for me to be better off. That's why inequality doesn't work right now. It can't be so one-sided to where only the gains only go to the first movers, right? It has to be for everyone, or eventually, as I said, malicious envy will make sure that it's for no one. I think I saw Simon's hand up again. Yeah, oh, Simon had a hand up, Joe had a hand up. We have a minute left, so let's get in uh, as many as we can. All right, let's go. go ahead. Okay. Who, you, at times you talked about income, and at times you talked about wealth. Those are not the same thing. And Piketty talks about capital and labor. What's the relationship between them, and where should the leverage point be? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first part of, of what you said. My uh, the, income the, the and wealth are two different things. Income and wealth. Income are two versus yeah. income. Income and wealth are absolutely so. Wealth is an accumulation. Um, and sometimes an inheritance, whereas income is something that can be earned. But for the majority of us, the way that we're going to establish our wealth is through income, right? So uh, both of these work in a fashion that can actually build on each other. Joe, can you get anything in in six seconds? No. Yeah, five seconds, Joe. <laughs> Four, no, we'll be all right. Three. We'll, we'll do it in the breakout room. Yes, so absolutely. You can ask more questions in the breakout room as well as everyone participating in the chat. Who fascinating, fascinating conversation. It's something I can talk about all day long. Thank you 
so much. Simon, Zoe, Joe, thank you for your incredible introspection and your responses to who's phenomenal talk. That's one that has to be ongoing. Yeah, that's a topic that has to be continued.